everybody. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to talk to another group of people in the real estate industry. A little bit of background just so that you understand some of the perspective that I'm bringing to this conversation today. Uh, I sat in my hotel room last night and I redid a whole bunch of my slides. Because I don't generally get to talk to people in the real estate industry, despite having spent a long time in the real estate industry myself. So I spent uh, 10 years, I had my own branding and marketing company that focused specifically on real estate issues. And for a part of that time, I was the Vice President of Marketing for the Sotheby's franchise across Canada. So I understand brokerage, uh, I understand real estate development. I know some of the stuff that you guys are going through right now. I understand some of the different things that are coming along and impacting your world. So I'm gonna try and be as specific to that as I can with my comments today. So I was finding myself going back through some of my old slide decks and uh, you know, finding things that I thought were really, really super important to, just for you. So this is a very customized speech today, just for you, and it may not come off the tip of my tongue quite as simply and easily and with as much patter as it does when I'm doing one of my speeches that I do over and over and over again, but I thought you guys deserved this, and I thought you guys deserved some sort of um, customization, so that's what I've done. The title of this speech is This Changes Everything, because what I'm going to tell you about today isn't just about your business, it's about your personal life, and it's about the world. These are things that we're seeing based on the research we've done with 65,000 people now across the planet, across North America. We've got 20,000 new people coming into the survey database from China in the next little while, and then we move on from continent to continent to continent. We are all living through something as a group that we've never lived through before. We're going through a massive change as a species, and that change means that stuff needs to be rethought and it's gonna impact your business, but I think even more interestingly, it's gonna impact your world, impact your life, impact your relationships, impact pretty much everything that you do. So I wanted you to know those two things, that this is about everything, and that this is very much about real estate. Uh, I'm gonna try and bring as much of my real estate brain to the table today as I possibly can. Uh, one of my friends, Douglas Copeland, you may have heard of him, he wrote a book called Generation X a long time ago. Uh, he said this very nice thing about me, I always like to point this out at the beginning of my speech, that uh, this is kind of what I think my job is these days. I sold my company that was about branding and marketing and the real estate development industry, and now I seem to be spending my time looking at patterns and looking at how things are connecting and taking this dot and that dot and putting it together and trying to find meaning in this crazy mixed up world that we're all living in right now. So a little bit of an agenda for what we're going to go through today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how technology disrupted my life. Uh, it started from the first day I walked in, out of uh, university and into my very first job working in an ad agency years and years ago. Uh, I'm going to go back and look at some of the things that we can learn from disruption that's happened over the course of history. Uh, we're going to look forward a little bit into what's coming down the tubes and what are some of the things that we might be able to learn from those situations. I'm going to give you six points that you should all probably think about jotting down, although I understand a video is being made today and this will all be available, so if you want to not jot it down too, that's fine, it's totally up to you, you're in control. Uh, six things that you might want to think about doing and ways to thrive, ways to get through this situation. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about value graphics, which is this new body of research that I've referenced, and one specific group of people that we've identified within the value graphics database that's called the Home Hunters Union. And these are people who have said to us that they have every intention of moving in the next couple of years. And we've gone and asked them all kinds of questions about their values, their wants, their needs, their expectations. So I can give you all kinds of information, and I'm going to share as much of it with you as I can today, about what these folks who are your potential clients for the next couple of years, what's on their mind? What are they feeling right now? Not who they are, how old they are, how much money they make, where they live, whether they're a man or a woman, or what race they are, what, um, uh, where they come from. None of that stuff really matters. These big changes we're going through right now is an amalgamation. We're all becoming sort of the same person. And so this particular value graphics profile, I think, is something that you'll find very interesting. So I want to start by telling you that I was born in 1965, and the reason that that's interesting, it used to sound like that wasn't very long ago. Now it sounds like that was forever ago, um, which I guess really translates to mean that I'm getting older. Um, 
But being born in 1965, at the very end of 1965, in fact, I was born in uh, October, so two months later, I would have been a Generation X. As it is, I'm a boomer. But I'm kind of the littlest boomer, right? I'm the youngest boomer possible. Two more months, 60 more days, and I would have been on the other side of the fence. So we look at some of the generational stereotypes about boomers and Generation X, and I kind of fit into both of those. So that's an interesting thing that was sort of in my head as I went forward, and then I'll come back to that again as we um, go through some of the rest of the information I want to share with you. I kind of, my, my indigenous friends say, I've got a foot in two canoes, right? I'm kind of half boomer and half uh, Generation X. This is a, a slide I put in here because it just to put you some, give you some context around my technological know-how. The kids behind me in high school were the first grade, they were one grade behind me. They were learning how to use computers. My class, we were in typing class. We had the woman at the front of the room with the metronome, tick, 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 and we had to keep up, F, J, F, J, F, J. Had to keep up with the metronome. That was our whole, that was a, thank goodness we learned how to keyboard, at least that was something useful. And then I went off to university, my mom and dad were so proud that they were sending me off to university and my university parting gift was a brand new electric typewriter that had an erase button so that I didn't have to have whiteout. And you remember how hard it was to write something in those days. You'd get halfway through a page and you'd use the wrong letter and the wrong word and you'd have to like erase it and try and figure out another word that had the same number of letters in it that you could put in there instead. Or start at the top and do the whole page all over again. It's hilarious now, isn't it? It's hilarious. I remember being, I lived in a frat house, and I remember my, sitting there with my electric typewriter, all proud, and the, the young guy came up next to me, who's like a year or two younger than me in the frat house, and he's like, let me show you how to use these uh, computers over here. And I was like, oh no, I don't need that. I'm not a computer science major. He said, just trust me, you'll like this. Big floppy disks, like this. Uh, stuck into the machine, you had to pull one out, put one in, pull one out, put one in, and somehow it all turned into a letter. And I didn't have to do that whole retyping thing anymore. But that gives you a little bit of a sense of where I sit in this whole technological timeline. The first disruption I remember was graduating from university. I got my job in an advertising agency in Winnipeg, which was my hometown. And a lot, I don't know, I was there maybe a month or two, and then we got a fax machine. Not only did we get one, we got two. And I'll tell you why. Primarily because no one else in town had one. So if you're gonna fax something to somebody, you had to have another fax machine. So what we did is we put one fax machine in the boardroom when the clients would come, and we put another fax machine went into the art department, the, other, the back end of the office, and then when the clients came over, we faxed stuff back and forth between the two fax machines, and the clients would all kind of run from one to the next to watch stuff coming out. They'd make marks on the paper, and then stick it, and then they go running back and go, oh my God, look, it's my signature. It's coming through this side. It came, it worked. I guess the point of it, was to prove that we were technologically advanced uh, and that we were on top of all this tech stuff. And so it seemed kind of funny. Oh, the other good thing, anybody who's old enough to remember Telex machines, we put this in the art department next to the Telex machine because we weren't quite sure about this fax thing. We knew the Telex machine was going to work. It was going to continue to deliver messages to us, but the fax machine uh, may just be a passing trend. But what happened? was the fax machine destroyed the courier industry, and it destroyed the telex industry, and it destroyed telegraphs. Has anybody in this room ever received a telegraph? A few of the old timers in the room. But it's a thing from old fashioned, old fashioned old time movies now, right? I mean, nobody gets or sends telegraphs anymore. And even the mail, largely, is gone. Canada Post doesn't like it when I say that out loud. I mean, what comes in your mail now except flyers and bills? And even bills are becoming more and more something that happens through your email. So that fax machine, as funny and silly as it seemed when it first showed up, when we had nobody else to fax anything to, it changed everything for the people in these industries. And then it changed us. Because what happened as a result of those beginning days of communication technology change, was that the speed and the pace within, with which we were supposed to work was incredibly jazzed. We couldn't take the time to sit and write a letter, type it out, put it in an envelope, stamp, 
post box, have the secretary take it down to the post office box. You wait a few days, somebody reads it on the other end, and they do the same thing and send a letter back. And that's how the pace of business went. Well, what happens today? If I get an email and I haven't responded to that email within 30 minutes, what's happening? I'm getting text messages going, why haven't you responded to the email I sent 30 minutes ago? The expectation around speed of communication has gone through the roof. So those, these disruptive technologies, when they come along, they aren't even really so much about the technology. My point is, they're about what they do to us as human beings, and how they change our lives, and how they change what's expected of us and what we expect of ourselves. More changes in my industry, just to give you some more examples, more rapidly. So this is the title of my speech, This Changes Everything. That's three different logos. Now, when I worked in the, started working in the advertising agency business, logos were a cash cow. Oh my gosh. A client would come in and say, I need a new logo, and the owner of the ad agency's dollar signs would just pop up in their eyeballs. Because logos, you could talk for days about how the strategic direction required around the ideas behind the logo and how it had to stand for something. It went on and on and on. It was easily a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar thing to design a logo. So the entire advertising agency industry, all those graphic designers, logos, that was a huge revenue source. These three logos cost me a dollar each, and I got them online from some guy I'm never going to meet, and it took about 10 minutes. So 10 minutes after typing in what I wanted my logo to be about, chose a few different characteristics, these things came back to me, this was three dollars worth of work. There's an entire revenue stream that's disappeared, and largely within the advertising and agency business, the graphic design business, all of those tools that used to be the sole property, the proprietary information and skill sets, are now freely available to anyone. These are three different websites for my speech today. This changes everything. Many of you will probably remember that point in history, maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, something like that, maybe just a little earlier, where the last holdout companies finally said to themselves, okay, fine, I'll get a website. Prior to that, it was just like the really kooky, groovy, cool companies that had ping pong tables instead of boardroom tables had websites. And if you wanted to get a website built for your company, the simplest website was a fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars spend because there was only two or three people who knew how to program a website, who knew all that secret code language. So for sixty thousand dollars, one of those wizards of coding might deign to give you some time and put a simple website together for you, one that my mother can now build in five minutes on her own, on her eight-year-old computer. So same story with these websites as it was for those three logos. Each one of these was five bucks. They're on generated templates. I did these myself. It took me about an hour, uh, and I got three different websites. So there's another entire revenue stream gone in the advertising industry, the advertising, graphic design, and marketing world. So I think that the reason I'm doing that is to just show you that this is not new. The stuff you're living through now, the disruptive technologies that are impacting your personal and professional lives have been here for a very long time. They've already impacted my industry. They're going to impact yours and continue to impact yours. And so we should be looking at the past to see what those patterns are and what we can learn from those patterns and where there's some joy to be found in some of the things that we see are happening. So let's go back and look at a couple of past big technological disruptive moments. One of them, of course, is the Industrial Revolution. So imagine you're a cobbler, and you're sitting at home in your home-based business, and your mom and your dad and your aunts and your uncles and your nieces and your nephews, you all live in one big house in the village, and you're the guy who's in charge of making shoes for everybody in the village. That was probably a pretty prestigious role. Everybody needs shoes, it was a guaranteed income. It was probably the equivalent of having a, a union job. There's no way the guy making shoes for everybody is ever gonna be out of work. And then comes the factory six miles down the road with people we've never met before that are churning out shoes like crazy and I'm out of business and it changes my life and I have to go and get work in a factory and I have to change the way my family lives. We can't be in a big giant family unit living under one roof anymore. I'm going to have to just, me and the wife and the kids maybe, we're going to have to move down the road and work in that factory. 
So families started to break up, villages started to break up. The way our genealogy started to uh, be impacted was, was changed dramatically. So the Industrial Revolution wasn't just about factories. The Industrial Revolution was about change that went deep-rooted into the, the very heart and soul of, the, of what it is to be a human being and what it is to have relationships and how we wake up every morning and go through our daily rituals. You know, as a result of factories, though, some really great things happened. We did get unions. Now, I don't know whether you love or hate unions today, but at the time, unions were a really important thing. They made it possible for people to negotiate and to make sure that they weren't being taken advantage of. That would never have happened had we stayed all working for ourselves in tiny little pods working in our home-based cottage industries. So being able to get together and make sure that you were getting a fair shake at a point in time was vitally important. It got rid of child labor. We managed to make things happen like weekends. There were no weekends when you worked for yourself, building shoes in your little factory and your little, your little home-based business. So suddenly people had leisure time. And because of that same moment in time, around when the factories were coming along, we started to get railroads and better transportation systems. On weekends, people were able to travel. They'd go to the next village or the next town and spend the weekend in a hotel and in a restaurant. So new industries bloomed, new things happened, new stuff started to come along. I just think the very idea that everybody was allowed two days off every week must have been earth shattering for someone who had never had a day off before. Vacations, paid vacations, it was just unheard of. After the Industrial Revolution, we went through the Computer Revolution. Now, we all are kind of tired of listening to stories about computers, but when you think back to that first Mac 2E that showed up in your homes, or maybe even had some in your offices, and they were really hard to use, and they were difficult, and they were kind of fun, but it was the geeks who got them, right? It was the guys with the slide rules and the pocket protectors who were interested in that kind of new technology. Maybe the graphic arts department, whatever company you were working for, was interested in that stuff. But as a result of that, the growth of small and medium-sized businesses was exponential. More and more people were able to start their own companies because you didn't need to have giant, huge server farms in the back room. You could work at home. You could telecommute. You didn't have to be at the office all the time. You could work long distance. You could work on the road. All kinds of things change. If you're spending more time at home because of computers instead of at the office, you have more time with your family, more time with your kids, more time with the wife. You've got more opportunity to be a real human being. Which is, leads me to a nice little sidebar. One of the things I like to do before I give a speech is a day or two ahead of time on LinkedIn. I throw up a, a little note and I say, hey everybody who follows me on LinkedIn, I'm about to go and talk to a group of people and they do this for a living. What do you want me to tell them? What do you want them to know? What have you got some messages for them? So I did the same thing. Went and talked to my friends on LinkedIn. I got a couple thousand of them there and asked them, uh, what do you want these realtors in Barrie, Ontario to know? What could they be doing better? What could they be doing, what are, what are they all already doing great? What is the realty industry in general? What should they know as we face the future together? Lots of different answers, lots of people looking at this message, lots of interest in your industry, by the way. It wasn't just like five or six people going, what's this guy on about today? I had hundreds and hundreds of people within 12 hours going, yeah, that's really interesting. What, what do we want them to know? And then the answers that came back all had one thing in common. They all want you to be human. But none of them said, give me more access to information. None of them said, I want you to be able to do things faster, better, stronger. They all said, do the stuff that makes, you, makes me feel like I'm dealing with a human being. So, you know what? That's never going to change. And I love it when I get those answers because it plays right into the last thing I want to talk about today, which is value graphics and about our human values being the way that we can see our way through all of this disruption. So the information revolution, we passed one. There's the computer revolution. I remember my dad trying to teach me how to run a slide rule. That did not go well. And thank goodness computers came along. I still have his slide rule. I kept it after he, uh, after he left us, but I have no idea what that thing does. Uh, sure looks cool, though. Uh, the information revolution. This is a really interesting thing to think about. There was a point in time, not that long ago, a few hundred years ago, where it was possible for one person to know everything that we knew. Think about that for a minute. One person could know everything. 
And then gradually we started to learn so much more about the world around us and the sciences blossomed and arts has, and humanities blossomed and all of these things. We started to explore our world and our universe and we knew nothing. Nobody could possibly know anything more than the one little tiny thing that they were responsible for doing that was one little cog inside a cog inside a cog inside a cog of the universe. And today we're back at a point where the sum total of human knowledge, everything we know about the entire universe is on this thing that's the size of half a slice of bread that I carry around in my pocket. That's a pretty crazy disruptive technology when you think about it. It's a, it's a remarkable time to be alive. So while this stuff is scary, and while this stuff is changing how we move through our day and what our rituals are, there's always hope. There's always these amazing opportunities that are presented. As one door closes, another one opens. The media revolution came along around the same time before, after you could argue with me about timelines. But there was a moment where suddenly everybody could tell their story. Everyone could be a newspaper. Everyone could be a radio station. Everyone could be a TV station. And you think about the system prior to that, you had to be one of the few individuals who had enough money to build these giant empires of newspapers and TV stations. You had to be Rupert Murdoch, and then you got to decide what truth was for the rest of us. You got to be the gatekeeper of what reality was. You could elect or get unelected the civic officials and politicians who run our lives and make decisions about our tax dollars because you were the media. Well, suddenly, everyone's the media. We have lots of people who want to tell stories, some of them good, some of them bad, some of them believable, some of them not believable. But what an amazing change, that barrier being broken where suddenly we all have the ability to do anything we want and it carries on and carries on and carries on. So there's a whole bunch of those examples I could go through, but I want to talk about this what I call the next one that I think is coming is where all these technologies you keep hearing about, 3D printing and the Internet of Things and uh, artificial intelligence, all this stuff, I think they're all going to come together very, very soon and they're going to make something that we can't even imagine right now. Some people talk about this moment as sort of the singularity. I like to call it the in integrated tech revolution where all of these things coming together are going to make it possible for things you can't even dream about today. And I'm going to give you an example of how far we're progressing along that road with just by picking on one particular technology that I've been researching a bit lately that I'm particularly fascinated with, and it's 3D printing. Now, many of us have seen 3D printers in operation. We've got, maybe even got one. Many of our kids have them. They're like the size of a coffee machine. They cost about 350 bucks now. You can get a 3D printer, which is kind of mind-blowing. A $350 3D printer, the size of a coffee machine that sits in your kitchen table. And it'll print out little things like this that, you know, if it was in a McDonald's Happy Meal, you'd chuck it. It's just like silly little things. But that technology, it's like the 3D, it's like the 3D printers today are at the dot matrix printing stage of development. Remember dot matrix printers, right? So that, think about how far those printers have come. Think about how quickly 3D printing is going to progress and where it's going to take us to. So this is a bust of me. A friend of mine made this. Uh, went over to his house for dinner and he took his iPad, sat me down in the chair, did, literally did this, walked around me with his iPad. It's like, okay, cool, let's go get a glass of wine. Went and got a glass of wine, came back, this thing came out, he has a slightly fancier 3D printer than the $350 version, he's probably had an extra zero on the end of the price tag. This thing was sitting there, he's put some gold paint on it and made it look all fancy. It's kind of weird having a bust of myself in my living room. It feels like I think I'm Mozart or uh, Beethoven or something. But it's, and it's, you know what's really interesting is when you hold a bust of your own head for the first time and you can see the back of your head. <laughs> You're like, that's what the back of my head looks like. Wow, that's kind of cool. So there's this, this, this thing got printed in the course of, as long as it took me to have a, a, gla a glass and a half of wine, this thing got printed out in my friend's living room. That's where 3D printing has already started to progress to. Now let me blow your mind further. 3D printed office towers and condominiums are happening in various parts of the world right now. Chunks of these buildings are being 3D printed off-site, trucked into these locations. 
and just assembled like giant Lego structures. And this is happening. This is a rendering that this is happening. And it's already, that they're already 3D printing houses at a rate of five or six or seven a day. They're not houses that you and I would want to live in, but these are houses that they're sending to Sudan and to parts of the world where there's housing issues. They're able to 3D print a home for these people for a fraction of the cost of building one. This is a 3D printed car, ladies and gentlemen. It goes from zero to 60 miles per hour faster than a McLaren supercar. These are being printed in California right now. You can get online and buy one. And it comes from a factory that costs about $100 million to build. A traditional car factory costs a couple of billion dollars to build. So we have a couple of hundred million bucks, which in the grand scheme of things is not that much money. It's, um, what, a smallish condo tower costs $100 million to build. So for that much money, you can have your own car factory. That's kind of cool. How many Elon Musks are we going to have in the next 10, 20, 30 years when it's that inexpensive to make and design and print a car? We are already 3D printing human organs. We're 3D printing them at the moment so that the surgeons can practice on them before they cut into the real thing. And they're made specifically to mimic what the scans are showing you. The particular valve problem on patient X is they'll make an actual 3D model with that valve problem so the surgeons can go in there and muck around a little bit before they cut into patient X to see if they can make sure that the valve's working properly. That's pretty remarkable use of this technology, but it gets better. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a genetically identical 3D printed rhino horn. Now that doesn't seem like the biggest deal in the world until you understand and realize and remember the stories you're reading about how we are poaching the rhinos to extinction for their horns. Because the Chinese market loves rhino horns for all kinds of reasons. I won't get into here because if you know the reasons, they're kind of not appropriate for a mixed audience. However, the guys who are making these rhino horns genetically identical are flooding the market with these things, so there's no reason to go kill the rhinos anymore. So because of 3D printing, we're probably going to save the species from extinction. That's a good thing. We're 3D printing food. There's pop-up restaurants in London right now where they pop up for two or three weeks. Everything in the restaurant is 3D printed. The food, the glasses, the tablecloths, the chairs, the tables, everything in the restaurant is 3D printed. There is no need for manufacturing facilities, for factories, for shipping, for transportation, for containers, for overseas stuff to come from China and big giant, you have to buy a thousand to get a price that, just print what you need and have a restaurant. It's that simple. These are 3D printed running shoes from Nike. They have booths that you go on and you just stick your foot in this thing. It's like an ATM machine in a mall and you make a few selections, you go to the Starbucks, grab a cup of coffee, uh, you know, to pick up your prescription, whatever it is you're going to do, and you go home, and the next day, bing bong, there's the FedEx guy dropping off the sneakers that you ordered at the mall, which sounds like a really cool trick, and I love the idea that I get to uh, be involved in printing my own and deciding what my sneakers are going to look like, but more importantly, I don't need a sneaker store now, or the staff, or the back room, or all the extra inventory, or the shipping, or the manufacturing, or any of that environmental degradation that comes with airplanes flying stuff back and forth all over the world from all of that changes because of these 3D printers. This one will blow your mind. I had an opportunity to meet the woman who is in charge of the Museum of Modern Art's design department. So what she does is decide what gets to come into the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So she collects the most important relics of our time the moments in history that she believes need to be preserved for the future. So one of the things as a sidebar that she collected, which I'm fascinated by how you can go about doing this, is she's collected the at symbol for the Museum of Modern Art because it is what holds our emails together. And without that, we wouldn't have email. So the at symbol is part of the collection of the design department at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And so is this little guy. He's about the size of your thumb, and he lives in a little a uh, petri dish full of sugar water. He drinks, eats the sugar water, that's what his fuel is. And then he, he expels waste when he's taken what he needs out of the sugar water. And if you tap the side of the glass, he'll react and like, ooh, that's not a good, that's a danger. I need to try to get away from that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the world's first 3D printed living organism. 
this thing came out of a printer. Now, it doesn't have a soul, as far as we know, but it has not yet been introduced to artificial intelligence. It has not yet been introduced to machine learning. It has not yet been introduced to any of these other technologies that are coming along. So imagine when that happens, when it goes beyond a squishy little octopusy looking thing, and this thing can actually stand up and say, hey David, how are you? I'd like to make you a cup of coffee. What would you like in it? What are we for then? If we can 3D print living sentient beings, we're already this far along. Last story about crazy technologies. And remember, this is just the stuff we know about. Imagine the stuff we don't know about yet. So a friend of mine uh, got to spend some time at the Google Cultural Complex in Paris. He's an artist in residence there. And so he got to poke around in the back rooms a little bit. And he was poking around the back rooms, talking to some of the scientists who work for Google, and particularly scientists who work for the Google Cultural Complex. And their mission, as a division of Google, is to come up with new technologies that don't necessarily have a purpose right now. We're not quite sure what they're for. And you're not really even supposed to monetize it. Just go and invent cool stuff. We'll figure out the rest of that later. They're big enough, they're Google, they can afford to do that, right? So they had a little piece of uh, tin foil in the back of his hand. It was connected with wires to this guy who was standing there with an iPad, and eventually those wires will be snipped. It'll be a Bluetooth thing. This is just a beta test version of this. So he's standing in front of a table. This is not him. This is just as close approximation of a photo as I could find. And the guy said, are you ready? He said, yes, relax your arm. OK, my arm's relaxed. He turned on his iPad, and my friend's hand came up, and he started writing Japanese. My friend doesn't know Japanese. So the guy with the iPad with how it was controlling, sending signals up into his brain, back down to his hand, and he was writing Japanese characters involuntarily on the paper on the table in front of him. Now this isn't a science fiction movie. This is happening right now. Someone's probably using that thing in Paris at the Google Cultural Complex. I'm probably going to be hunted down and killed now that I revealed this top secret technology that they have in the back room. But imagine when we're going to get to be able to be at the point where a surgeon on one side of the world is able to control the hands of a surgeon on another side of the world without being in the same room and perform an operation through someone else. And when that, I just, even just these few technologies I've shown you today, I want you on your drive home today to think about what it would look like if you start putting all of those together into one thing. If you had that octopus who could 3D print stuff and who could control the motions of other people and other octopuses, and it wasn't an octopus anymore, and it was able to think on its own, and it was able to have its own life, that's where we're headed. With just one strain of technology, just one 3D printing, we're not even talking about all the other stuff that's possible yet. So how can you possibly get through this? Think about the technologies that you're concerned about right now, how your customers in the real estate industry seem to know more about the properties you're showing them than you do. How MLS is under attack, your proprietary systems are under attack. The knowledge base, which was always what you had to sell, I know this neighborhood, I know the people here, I know what that guy's backyard looks like, I know the problems in that house and in that building. All that's freely available to anybody who takes 10 minutes to go and look. It's a very difficult time to figure out what's your stronghold going to be. How can you survive and thrive through this? So there's six things I think you can take on. Three actions and three tactics. Now my slides are going to be available. If you want to just keep listening, that's cool. If you want to write these down, that's cool too. Uh, but there's six things that I think that I've learned from watching all this stuff in the past and what's coming at us in the future that I think will help us all survive. I've used most of these myself. First one, don't be the ostrich. I'm very guilty of this. Oh, I'm not techie. I don't want to learn how to use that new thing. I don't want to understand that new whatever. That app confuses me. I have enough buttons in my life. I can't be part of that. I'm too old. Can't be that guy. You can't. You have to take your head out of the sand and go, you know what, this is the new reality. This, the fact that these technologies are coming along and changing my world is something I just have to get my head around. 
that billions and billions and billions and trillions of dollars that were spent just last year in startup technologies who are all about the real estate industry is mind-boggling. The hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of apps and companies and technologies that are all trying to eat a little tiny bit of your lunch, each one of them. You're competing with so much technology, so many teams of people, you can't afford to just pretend it's not there. And too many people, particularly when they get to the back end of their careers and they figure, I only got a couple years left here. I can just coast. Maybe you can. But you know what? Way more fun not to. Way more fun to actually engage with what's going on in the world and see what we can do about surviving and thriving. 33% of the data of every website out there in the world right now goes unmonitored. Do you know who's been on your website in the last week? Do you know whether your website's pulled more hits or less hits than it did the week before? And can you tell me why? What it is you did differently this week versus last week? What about that social media post you put out on Twitter this morning? You know there's a button on there that you can see the analytics and it'll tell you whether you did how it did. And you can push the same button on the previous tweet and see how it did. Are you using that information? It's there, they're giving it to you for free. Saying, hey, here's what your actions are doing. Why don't we learn from those and use it as a feedback loop? Great example of somebody who kept their head in the sand and didn't try and learn from their actions is Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, who, grew, who didn't grow up with a set of Encyclopedia Britannica in the living room, right? My mom and dad had to save for ours. It was on a payment plan, but they figured it was essential to my education. God bless them. Uh, to have that encyclopedia, encyclopedia set sitting there. Uh, for 243 years, Encyclopedia Britannica was a must-have for every parent of every kid going to every school in the Western world. And they ignored Wikipedia. They ignored Google. They ignored online technologies. And Encyclopedia Britannica, ladies and gentlemen, is no more because they kept their head in the sand. So I think there's a lot of futile protectionism that happens. It's a response mechanism that human beings take. We're like, no, you can't change that. No, you're not allowed to do it. That's not the way it's always been. It hasn't been like that before. I'm uncomfortable with the way you want this to be in the future. You know what, you can dig in your heels and you can clench your fists and hold your breath until you turn blue and it's still gonna happen. So all you've done is spend some time digging in your heels, turning blue and clenching your fists. That's the only thing that's changed. So why don't you just skip that bit and instead just go, okay, you know what? The future's coming. I have to embrace this. I'm going to have to make this make sense for me. Let's get my head out of the sand. Second thing you need to do is gather information. You need to go wide and you need to go deep. There is so much information out there about what's available, about new technologies that you could be using, about things that your competitors are already doing. And not just your competitors, but people who are maybe just on the sideline of being your competitors. How's Airbnb affecting your business? How's Airbnb affecting the ideas that people have as they come in to shop and look for a building, look for a home? How are all these other technologies that may not traditionally be seen as part of your industry or necessarily a direct competitor, how are they now starting to become influences in the buying decisions and the listing decisions that people are making as they consider whether they're going to work with you or not? You need to go wide and deep. And I have a couple tricks that I've learned that I'm going to share with you. The first one is get your own journalist. Now, it sounds kind of crazy. Uh, however, there are still a lot of kids going to school and they're graduating with journalism degrees. And they have not much to do. Newspapers, I was reading in the Globe this morning or the Post or whatever it was at my hotel. Newspapers are finally standing up and asking the government for help. Saying, look, we're, there won't be any newspapers if you don't give us some, some health care. Uh, journalists are hungry. You can go and put an ad up on Craigslist and say, hey, I want to hire a part-time journalist. And you'll have 100 people who will apply. And for 20 bucks an hour, which is what I pay mine in Vancouver, and Vancouver's expensive, probably I'm for 15 bucks an hour here or less, whatever minimum wage is. Anytime I want to learn about something, I call up my journalist and go, hey, I just read this thing about this weird octopus at the Museum of Modern Art, and it can move, and it's a 3D printed jelly thing that the speaker was talking to. I just like, go do me a one pager on that. And he goes and does a one pager on it and brings it and says, here you go. So I don't have to spend my time running around trying to figure out what that little octopus is about. I just call my journalist. And my journalist goes and does the research for me. So get one. They're cheap. 
Uh, a journalist will love you. A J school grad will, will, will thank you for asking them to be their, your personal researcher. And then you can stay on top of everything you hear about without having to go and figure it out yourself. I also have a personal reader. I have a guy. Happens to be, now you may not get this lucky, but he happens to be the guy who I work out with. He's my trainer. And he loves reading books. So the deal I made with him is a sweetheart deal. You may not be this lucky. Uh, my sweetheart deal with this guy is I give him books that I'm interested in, he reads them for me, and then while we work out, he tells me what was in the book. So I don't have to read the books, because there's that stack of books we all end up with beside our desk or beside our bed, right? All the stuff, everybody you meet says, oh, this great business book you should read, good to great, or better to amazing, or how to you know, kill everybody except you know, the people you don't want to kill, or whatever the book is called, the book of the month, the book of the week, we're all supposed to be on top of. It's impossible. So get someone else to do it. Get someone else to do it. Even if I was paying him 10 bucks an hour, or pay 50 bucks a book or whatever, to stay on top of all those business books and management books, worth every penny. And it's kind of fun at a cocktail party to say, yeah, I have a personal reader. <laughs> so there's that, too. That's another bonus. Last thing, look for bright sparks. This is, again, remember around this whole notion of how to, how to survive and thrive. This is just the second point I have for you, but the third way to do this to make it a little bit easier is to look for what I call bright sparks. In any industry, in any topic, in any category, around any particular subject that you care to look at, there's always going to be a bright spark. Just pay attention to them, ignore the rest. It'll give you enough of an understanding. So you're interested in electric cars? Go see what Elon Musk is doing. You don't really need to understand all the other hundred companies that are trying to be Elon Musk. Just understand what Elon Musk is doing and consider it done. Tick. You can have your reader read a book about Elon Musk and call your journalist and have them do a one-pager for you about electric cars, and you're out. Don't get too caught up in these spirals of, uh, that the internet wants you to get into where you end up spending hours on YouTube and before you know it, you're watching cat videos and it's four in the morning. You can't do that. You, there's too much to pay attention to, but you have to pay attention. You have to get your head out of the sand. Don't be the ostrich. Think about hiring a journalist, a reader, and looking for bright sparks. Action number three, be the first or be the best. Uh, this all sounds like some kind of pop psychology stuff, but it was held true over and over and over and over again. When we get into some of the more specific tactics and strategies you might want to consider as a real estate agent, you've got to be the first one to do some of these things. And to be the first one, it means your head can't be in the sand, and you have to be on top of the information that's available that your competitors already know about. And once you have those things under control, you can be the first to do whatever this strategy is or that strategy is that you might be interested in. Well, I'm running really late here. I'm going to keep moving. Um, or you have to be the best. If somebody else is already in that sector doing that thing, that's fine. Uh, but do it better than them. Those are your only two choices. You can't be second or almost as good. Those are not possibilities. You have to be one of those two. Be the mindshare disruptor or focus on pain points. When somebody's buying a home, there's a lot of pain points. There's a lot of stuff I'm sure you get asked all the time. Well, who's gonna, I, I need to renovate the, and the yard needs a, and the, uh, my kids at the school, uh, all that stuff that's adjacent, all that pain that is part of the process. Why don't you just help them with that? Why don't you be the person that makes it painless? that can bring all those other folks together. Maybe some of those things can even be revenue streams for you. But whatever it is, the worst thing you can possibly say to someone is, that's not my job. My job is to make sure that you get the best deal on the right home. That's all I need to do. Because it's not all you need to do if you want to survive and thrive. Three tactics you need to specialize. <clears throat> I like to talk about how if you go to see the GP, your, your family doctor, and he says, take these pills and do this thing and do that thing, you might go, mm, maybe uh, I read on Google that this could happen, it might be this, it might be that, or whatever. But if you have an ear, nose, and throat issue, and you've waited six months to get into the ear, nose, and throat specialist, and he says, take these three pills three times a day and do this thing, you're going to do it. And you're going to wait for it, and you're going to be happy to pay for it, because he's a specialist. He's not a generalist. The more you can specialize, the more you're going to stick out. And that's how you're going to survive and thrive in an industry that's being hit by disruption. I have a favorite story about a guy. There's one guy in North America who knows how to take pictures of big giant trucks that is made by Mac and Peterbilt and some of the big truck companies, Western Star or Kelowna. 
and he gets paid a gazillion dollars to fly around the world and take pictures of these things as they roll off the assembly line each year because he's a specialist. Now think about how many photographers are making a buck these days. Photography is a hard gig unless you're a specialist like this guy, and he's doing very, very well. Now all these tools that are starting to eat your lunch, all this technology that's coming along and starting to make it difficult to do the stuff that you want to do, it's also the same tools that are going to allow you to expand your geographical reach. Did you know, for example, that when you're uh, using various online platforms to talk to people through, the, uh, uh, through your computer, uh, that most of them now have simultaneous translation programs built into them. So just because somebody from Quebec might be wanting to move here to Barrie and buy a home or a condo and they don't speak any uh, English and you don't speak any French, you can use Skype and Skype will do the translation in real time for you. And it's like 34 languages now it's up to or something like that. So you can theoretically be doing business with people who are coming here from anywhere in the world. You don't have to be able to talk their language. So just one example of how these technologies can help you expand your geography. Also do what I'm doing, get up here, be an authority, find the thing that you're going to be a micro-specialist around, and then start sharing it and talking about it, and using these tools to, that allow you to be your own TV station, your own radio station, your own newspaper, and tell the world everything that you know. Give it away. Be as much of an authority as you possibly can. And so I'm living proof. I got through the disruption of the advertising and marketing world. I'm doing just fine. I'm trying to keep my head out of the sand and grow and keep pay attention to what's going on around me. And I know you guys can all do it as well. And I want to quickly end here with a little bit on value graphics. This is the stuff that you'll find perhaps very useful. This is the stuff from um, our uh, 65,000 surveys about what people value. Because what seemed very apparent to me when we started to do this was that regardless of the technologies, those fax machines seemed super cool at one point, and now nobody uses fax machines anymore. Those 3D printers seem super cool today, and at some point in the future, they're going to seem hilarious and antiquated the way we think about fax machines today. So that stuff's going to come and go and come and go and come and go. But the one thing in our world that has never changed since before the Industrial Revolution and will continue to be the one thing that doesn't change through all the disruption coming at us is what we value. What we value is what makes us human. And being human is what my friends on LinkedIn said they wanted a realtor to be. So let's talk about being human. Nobody acts their age anymore. This is a wonderful new thing that's starting in our world. I have friends who are in their 90s. My friend Gordon and I love getting together and smoking cigars, which I'm not supposed to do, and we drink whiskey, which I'm also not supposed to do, and talk about our days living in Winnipeg. We lived there at different times, but we have a great time, about once a month. He's 98 years old. He's in a wheelchair. He's a famous Canadian painter. He's got paintbrushes on the end of sticks, so he can still do his paintings, and they sell for two or $300,000 a piece, and he paints six hours a day, six days a week in his studio because no one's told him he's too old and he should slow down. That's fabulous. I met another young guy in Berlin a couple of years ago named Mahir. And Mahir, when he was 14, entered the Google Science Fair, which is an international global science fair, with this project about how fruit flies move around. Because he thought it would be really cool if we could make flying robots. He's a kid, he's 14. Robots, insects, thinks this is all very amazing. And his fact did such a great job, he won the Google Science Fair for his idea about flying robots that move like fruit flies. And before he knows it, MIT and Stanford are on the phone, and he ends up collaborating for two years with those scientists, and they made those flying robots, and now they use those flying robots to go into collapsed buildings after earthquakes and see if anybody is still alive in there. And because of 14-year-old Mahir, we're saving lives. Thank God his parents didn't say, put down that science fair project and go play with a ball like a normal child, or we wouldn't be saving lives. I just told you about Gordon, and I just told you about Mahir. So I'm sitting in a cafe one day reading a newspaper and realizing that what I had just finished writing a book about, baby boomers downsizing to condos and apartments from their single family homes in the suburbs, the things that baby boomers wanted and that they were scared of losing when they moved out of their single family homes. Dad wanted his workbench, his tool bench in the, in the garage is one example. Mom was worried about uh, her sewing room and 
know, baking pies and having a garden because she wanted to make pickles like she's done every year. How am I going to do that in an apartment? And I'm reading this article in the New York Times in this cafe about uh, the maker culture that's blossoming out of Portland and Seattle is where it's begun and it's sort of grown all over the world now. And it's about millennials, of course, millennials. What isn't about millennials these days, right? There's enchanted unicorns in a special secret forest. So the millennials that we have to change our world for, what those millennials are interested in is woodworking. They're going to the tool lending library and getting the saw so that they can make furniture. And the millennial women are learning how to knit and sew. And they're really interested in making pickles and sauces and baking pies and growing organic vegetables. Like, wait a minute. Is this an article about boomers? Checked. Nope. Got my reading glasses on? Yep. Uh, these are the same people, as far as I could tell, so I decided I was going to write a book about how millennials and boomers, we should be building buildings. Don't forget, I'd spent my life in the real estate industry. We should be building buildings specifically not for people based on how old they are, but based on whether or not they wanted to live in buildings. Like, so let's, let's just go ask them what they should be based on. Let's go and find out what it would take to build buildings that millennials and boomers and everybody of all age could live in. Is this even possible? And we did it. We got back after 7,000 surveys. People said, I do not want to live in a building with people the same age as me. I don't want to be in an age-based ghetto. In fact, they said, I'll pay as much as 15% more than market value if you can tell me that the people I'm in that building have the same values that I do. I don't care how old they are. I want them to be interested and passionate about the same things as I am. And I'll pay 15% more for that privilege. When's the last time someone offered to pay more for something? This is epic, really, when you think about it. We've proven that age is over. Age doesn't matter. This changes the marketing textbooks. All that stuff about age-based segmentation. The first question we're all supposed to ask about any new thing we do in any industry is what's the target age group we're targeting our resources at, our finances, our human resources. How old are they? Are they 18 to 24, 25 to 36? We have these categories memorized in the ceremonial boardrooms that we sit in, like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. We sit in there and decide what's the age group we're going to build this thing for. 25 to 36, 37 to 45, 46 to 54, 55 to 66, or the dreaded 65 plus. <coughs> if you get a survey in your email and it doesn't use those categories, you know, you notice it. That's how ingrained these are in our lives. You look at it and go, wait a minute, it's supposed to be 18 to 24. This one says 18 to 29, that's weird. Why did they do that, I wonder? We recognize it when we go off script. So I think this changes everything, because everything in this room, everything you're touching, everything you've seen today, everything you're wearing, everything you've had to eat or drink, or everything you encounter after you leave this room today started in one of those ceremonial boardrooms somewhere with a bunch of probably guys sitting around saying, what's the age group of the person we're designing this thing for? What if they were sitting around in that boardroom instead and said, this thing we're designing, this product, this service, this program, this idea, this institution, what do the people we're making this for care about? What if that was the question that everything in the world started with, instead of how old are you? It would be a very, very different world, and now I think we can get there. This is going to be the name of my new book. We are all the same age now, and we have stats to back it up. The problem is organizations can't be all things to all people. We still need to be able to segment somehow and decide who we're going to target and what they're interested in. But until very recently, until this bad database that I've come up with, age was the only way we had to profile an audience. And it's not that I'm some sort of genius. Basically, I just noticed that the logarithmic technologies that are being used by Facebook and other social media platforms are a great way to recruit survey respondents. So we could get 65,000 people in a database, which is the numbers you need in order to profile entire target audiences. Prior to this, you'd need guys with clipboards in shopping malls trying to get you to fill out a survey, or phoning you during dinner to see if you would please don't hang up, or sending out batches of emails that everybody deletes and one guy in a thousand bothers to fill out. But we used Facebook, we used LinkedIn, we used Twitter, we used all their, their incredibly highly paid scientists who do nothing but figure out how to target people to build this 65,000 person database about what everybody values. 
and wants and needs in the world. And it's because we're living through this values renaissance right now. Values, who hasn't had a conversation at the office about our brand values, our customer values, our corporate values, the values of our product, uh, what kind of values do we stand for here? But values are a really big thing. And it's because of this one fact. And I wish I had discovered this, but I, I didn't. This is something that the psychologists, the scientists, the consumer behaviorists, they all agree with this. What we value determines what we do. You use your values as a way to make every single decision you make all day long. So if I can tell you the values of a target audience, you can get them to do what you want them to do. So that's pretty powerful. That's what we're able to do now. I'm going to skip this story because I want to do this and tell you about this particular value graphics archetype. So I'm going to skip ahead through all that stuff. Giant database full of values. There's 10 groups that became very, very apparent as the most powerful value sets in the world right now. One of them applies to what you do for a living. I'm going to tell you what I know about these guys. 37% of the population fits into this category called the Home Hunters Union. And they agree on all 340 different metrics that we tested around values, wants, needs, and expectations. They agree 85% of the time on all of those things. They're incredibly aligned. To put that into perspective, if we ask boomers those same 340 questions, they only agree with each other 13% of the time. Generation X agrees with each other 11% of the time. And the millennials, because they have to win, Millennials agree 15% of the time, but still, that's hardly enough for them to even be considered a group. This group agrees with each other on everything 85% of the time. So what that means to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you spend a dollar targeting this group based on these values that I'm about to show you, you have an 85% chance you're going to get them to do what you want them to do. If you target boomers, you're going to get a 13% chance that you're going to get them to do what you want them to do. So this is powerful information. Now, I don't want you to be confused by the name Home Hunters Union. Home Hunters means they just don't feel at home right now. When we ask them, do you think you're going to move? They go, yeah, pretty sure I'm going to move because I'm not feeling really at home. But then again, it might just be that they need to change their job or change their spouse or change their recreational activities. There could be something else that comes along. So not 37% of the population is prepared to move in the next two years. That would be an outrageous, creative, uh, very creative number for us to be thinking about in terms of the potentiality. But some portion of them, anyone who is going to move, is in this group. And here's what they're thinking about right now. They've said they're at least somewhat likely to move in the next two years. So you know those scales, not likely at all, likely, somewhat likely, very likely, extremely likely, oh my god, I'm doing it tomorrow, like those whole scales that we ask on, right? So these guys are at least somewhat likely. Everybody else we didn't put into this pile. They highly value the ability to meet their basic, basic needs. I need to know that I'm going to have a roof over my head, I'm going to keep my family fed, that I'm going to be safe and warm and happy, that my kids are going to be at a good school, that my wife is going to like this neighborhood, that I'm going to have a restaurant to go to. Basic needs. And what do we do in our industry instead? A lot of the time, we spend a lot of time talking about stuff that isn't basic. We're trying to talk about, oh, country club estates, living at its finest, and the something, something about this particular home, or this condo, or the whatever. We get all caught up in the magic and the mystery of what it is that we're trying to tell people about. And these folks, not so interested in that. Tell me my wife is going to be happy. Tell me my kids are going to be OK at that school. Tell me that their bedrooms are far enough apart that they're not going to be up all night fighting. Tell me that I'm not going to be on the same floor in my bedroom, so even if they are up all night fighting, I'm not going to have to listen to them. Basic stuff. I talk to condo developers about this one, and I say to them, you know, nobody really cares where the marble countertops were sourced in your kitchen. And in fact, why marble? Marble really scratches easy and 
it gets discolored quite easily. You should be smart about this and let's give them a more basic solution. It can still be a beautiful countertop, but maybe it's made out of carbon fiber because it's the strongest material in the world and does not scratch and is impermeable to stains. That's what these folks want to hear. Not about fanciful mm, stuff that isn't basic. They rank order the experiential over the material. More interested in what it's going to be like to be here. What's it going to feel like to be in this neighborhood? What kind of people live around me? What's my day going to be like? And instead, what do we say? We say, look at our stainless steel kitchen appliance package. We say, look how big the bathroom is and off the main. Those are the things that we seem to be more interested in telling them about, which are exactly the things they're not really as concerned about as they are about the experience of living in this space and what it's going to be like to be there. Their highest priority is their family. Remember that family today doesn't necessarily mean just my wife and the kids. It can also mean my family of friends, my family from work, my family at the club, my family and whatever, you know, my soccer team. I have all kinds of families and I'm concerned about them all. But of, of them all, my biological family, my, my spouse and my 2.3 children, that is my biggest concern. But don't forget about all those other families that they're going to be concerned about as well. And it's their number one priority. How is this house, this condo, this neighborhood, this street going to impact my family? Talk to them in that kind of language and you're going to get them to listen. You're talking exactly into what they're wanting to hear. They're apolitical and half of them have never voted. I found that quite interesting, but the more I thought about it from a sociological perspective, the more it made sense. Because you know what's interesting about this group of people is they're very inward right now. Something's not quite right. They're the home hunters, right? They're a little, the other name we use for them sometimes is they're a little restless. They're like, something doesn't feel good. I'm not sure what it is. It's probably my home. I don't have time to think about political issues. I don't have time to think about who's the mayor or who's the premier or who's the president or who's the prime minister or any of that stuff. Ah, it's low on my priority list. What's important is me and my family and our experiences. That's what's important. They're likely to frequently feel insecure, anxious, unsure. These are words they used, 65,000 surveys, 37% of them saying these things to us about this experience they're going through right now. We live in insecure, anxious, and unsure times. I'm not that surprised to see this come out, but with this group in particular, it rose to the top as a very, very significant piece of how they think about their day. So you need to be understanding. You need to be a guidance counselor. You need to be a psychologist. You need to be a therapist. I'm seeing some nods from some guys in the room here. Yep, yeah, that's part of our job. We get that. It's probably part of your job and you get that because you've sort of lived it for a few years. But I'm telling you right now that there is nobody that you're talking to about buying or selling a home who isn't feeling this stuff right now. This isn't just a side effect of your job anymore. This is part of job one of your job every single day. Oddly, big sports fans. Kind of a weird outlying fact about this group, but not so weird and not so outlying. When you think about what being a sports fan is about, it's being part of a big family. At least for an hour, we're all gonna agree on one thing. Those guys suck. Those guys are awesome. So I get to feel like I'm part of something bigger than me. I get to belong to something. I get some sense of family out of this. So that's wonderful, good news to know. Use that, give away sports tickets, get them involved in the local sporting scene. You, you, whatever you can do to make sure that they understand that that's here for them will be a very big part of making them feel at home. Interestingly, at this moment in their lives, they're realizing that unconventional living and unconventional features are something they're going to have to consider. And so they're, it's, you know, they're, they don't have a problem with that. So these are the folks who might be interested in a room that has a sliding wall where the dining room is now twice as big when I have big family dinners and it's now twice as small because I'm going to use this as my home office over here or things that fold out of the walls or uh, maybe even you know co-housing opportunities or life leases or some of these other things that are starting to pop up as alternatives to the way we think about what home means to us. These folks, their head's in that. They're okay with it. Don't be shy. And in fact, look for those sorts of unconventional features and unconventional living uh, ideas and pull those out and make those part of what you're talking about. So these are my big wrap-up slides. I know I've already run over. I'm sorry to keep you long, but I, I did have a technological glitch I'm going to blame this on.
a couple of big points I want you to walk away with. This is really an interesting fact. You share a birthday with about 18 million people on this planet, and there is not one shred of evidence to prove that you share anything in common with any of them. It makes sense. The age of age is over. Age is no longer a thing. So stop using age-based ideas about who we're talking to, how we target our financial and human resources, how we build our services and our products and our ideas. Age shouldn't even be on the table. But what we value makes us human. And no tech is ever going to come along and change that. We're always going to be humans. We're always going to have these values. We're always going to feel certain ways and believe certain things and have these things that we share that make us part of the brotherhood of man. And nothing is ever going to come along and change that. No fax machine, no little squiggly octopus from the Museum of Modern Art, no artificial intelligence robot, none of the stuff is going to change the fact that values make us human and values can be this firm footing for all of you as you face all the disruption that you're facing on a daily basis. And that's, finally, I just want to invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, as you can tell, I like to talk. So there's lots of video, there's lots of blogs, there's lots of information about my upcoming book. Um, love to be connected with all of you on LinkedIn. Um, I'm pretty hard to miss. It's not going to be hard to find me. If you just do a little search on LinkedIn, you'll find me. That's my primary channel. I do uh, participate on Twitter and, and on Facebook and Instagram. But, less excitedly. Uh, LinkedIn is where you'll find a lot of really great information about the stuff we've talked about today that you might find useful as you move through the rest of your, the rest of your hopefully long and prosperous career. So thank you very much for your time.